was uh, the, the thing of the continuity <laughs> because we were shooting different things in different times and they yeah. were moving things around so we had to be sure that everything was at the same place that was before or for example the same amount of uh, coffee or sugar or brandy or you know, the props we were just <laughs> Oh dear. It's like the weeds were up to here, like. Yeah. They're up to here. It was a whole summer's worth. It was a mental big pile of weeds. You've got no idea, man. All this. What's all that about? Yeah, he's obviously just decided he didn't. We planted weeds all the way around it. This here was all planted up with weeds. Water I'm just having to call Jane. We're here at Cable Street Gardens for our location and we've had a bit of a curveball because they've, as you can see, they've dug up all the weeds that were like four foot high and has completely ruined what we planned for our script in terms of it being overgrown. So as you can see, he's cut down a fin and lit a bonfire. <laughs> and we shoot in approximately 10 days. This is how it should have been at the end. But now we have to think of something else. And like you said, just put some weeds in between like giant objects. Exactly. Whether that be a wheelbarrow, pots, um, old kitchen sinks, all that kind of stuff. Like plastic, the cable. Oh, yeah, all this rubbish. Make it look like a, like a dumpster. It's got to, it's got to look like his own personal junkyard. You want to turn up here and go, oh my God, I don't want to deal with clearing that up. It's got to feel, got to feel like a bit of Sam. That he's like... As we were here today, we came across our first sort of big problem on the shoot, as you always sort of get on these things. Um, and you just have to sort of turn a negative into a positive. But what happened is the, the allotment owner of the allotment that we're being loaned destroyed all the weeds and all the plants that we were cultivating. And he's put a padlock on the shed, which we've built. But hopefully we'll rectify that. We'll turn a negative into a positive and somehow make the allotment look like it's been thriving on neglect by uh, Norman, which is the part of Brian Cox we play. So hopefully we can sort that out. But uh, I guess we'll have to see. first met Mac about another project and then about a couple of months later he sent me an email he said this is a bit of a long shot but uh, we're now going to be doing a short film would you be interested to do it within about less than four hours he emailed me back going let's do this it felt great <laughs> I was actually out to uh, to dinner with my wife and um, sort of just checked my phone we were just about to leave the restaurant and uh, I went oh my god Phil May, who said he's going to fly back from LA and come and make our movie. She went, what? You know, he shot Casino Royale, The Long Good Friday, Scum, Mask of Zorro, Entrapment. You know, I'm just naming a few and I love all those movies. I liked him and his approach to filmmaking and it was a case of me wanting to uh, experience that and find out what he was really like. People that are not experienced will ask to do things that maybe you've not done. And you think, can that be done? Do you know what? And maybe there is a way of doing that. And I find that very interesting. You know, what you look for is a director who has a vision who thinks I can do something with this and not just follow the normal pattern. You know. Phil has a huge amount of experience as a DOP, so he understands what the story needs very, very quickly. I mean, he moves fast. The shoot's going really well. I mean, Ryan Chandler, who's our first AD, is doing a fantastic job. In the short films I've made, it's gone the most smoothly. We didn't have much preparation time, basically because we were told about Brian Cox's availability at very short notice. He had three days he could do in September, and we found out about that approximately 11 days before those days. So having that really short run in time meant that we only had really two weeks of five working day periods to pull everything together. We've done a little bit of prep on the location, Damien had already built the shed, but that was about as much as we've done. The shed's got quite a story because originally when Matt came to me, we went through all the shots, what he needed, and this particular scene when Sam pours the pills into Norman's mug, Norman tastes it when he's outside and realises something's wrong, and we need to create a lot of suspense of what he's going to do to Sam when he realises there's something wrong, and we need to get Sam's fear as to what's going to happen to him. 
and so we need to create a lot of time from Norman tasting the cup, storming back into the shed. We have Norman walking all the way past the shed with glass all the way along so we can see him from Sam's point of view stomping back in. And I looked at countless number of sheds and none of them had that kind of a layout. They, don't, they just simply don't get built with that kind of a layout. So the best next thing I could do was to fuse two sheds together. I did a lot of research on sheds and styles. And I really liked potting sheds because they've got a sloping wall of glass which creates a really nice dynamic angle and I saw other people's designs where they've played with those angles so I thought I'll do the same. So we bought two sheds really cheap and we fused them together which is a lot of work here because there's no electricity so we can't use any power tools that would normally speed things up. No circular saws, everything cut by hand, like a patchwork of sheds. So yeah, it took an awful long time, but it was a beautiful summer, so it was quite a nice job to be doing. The results are there, and it looks amazing, it looks really, really cool. I'm very proud of everybody who worked in it, to be honest. They did a great job. Perfect setting, anyway. It has a kind of curiously uh, magical quality about it. Nightmare for a crew with all the noises. You've got the trains here, you've got planes from London Airport constantly going over, you've got schoolboys and schoolgirls shouting at the top of their voice, you've got helicopters that periodically come over on patrol. So it's, the ambient sound is quite interesting, I and mean, you've got this little oasis in the middle of nowhere. I can't believe that this is not a set. It's so beautiful that you'd think that this has been created for it. I mean, the fact that they found this location is one in a million, surely. Finding the flat and the allotment next to each other is like film gold. Well, you've always got to make a little adjustment. You don't have to do that with this place. It's just, it is perfect. You feel the atmosphere. You feel what this is. This is about Oasis, you know, it is Oasis in the middle of all this kind of craziness of London, and you feel that quite strongly. At the time that I was writing it, I was living in a flat um, up in Golders Green and it backed onto an allotment. And um, I remember a conversation I had with my partner at the time about getting a plot on the allotment. And we were talking about it and she said, somebody probably has to die before we get one. Um, and that got to thinking and then at the time my grandfather was living in Kent and I'd go down and visit him and when I arrived uh, I'd always be like hey granddad how are you doing uh, what have you been up to and he's like nothing just sitting here waiting to die and I was like okay um, great so those two things together started me thinking about a story where I could combine those elements I felt really bad that my granddad was so lonely and um, maybe this, you know, this film, the film kind of gave him a friend, so that's how I wrote it. I'm Joe Reynolds, I'm nine years old and I'm around 130 centimetres tall. I play Sam, the main character. He's into his gardening. Like, no computers, nothing like that, just gardening. He really loves his plants. It's so organised on his balcony up there, but it's really packed. He really wants an allotment. Sam breaks into this allotment, and so he comes in thinking he could get the allotment because it's empty, and then starts doing stuff for the allotment. He finds Norman. And it's the coming together of two stubborn souls. They sort of achieve a kind of uh, a halfway house between them. That's me, the writer I've known for years, and uh, she sent over the script and just asked me for a bit of a hand. We met up with, um, with Mac and Natalie, uh, and we just talked over a few ideas and people. Brian was our top choice from day one, and finding you know, Joe took a while. So once, basically it was about finding Joe, really I think it's um, a testament to how good the script and the story is that Natalie wrote, and always it was to cast it, apart from our young man. I think when I started writing it, I didn't really think about the casting um, or the fact that it might be tricky to get <laughs> um, an eight-year-old boy that could act. Like it's quite a complex character for a child to play. But Joe was, yeah, he was just not phased by any of it. I mean, even in his, his audition, like 
He's a very clever boy and he just understood quite immediately like what was needed. A basis plant whose fiber is woven into linen fabrics. Um, flax. How did you know that? I know stuff about plants. Mum got me some books. I didn't think you kids even read anymore. I do. When it first got submitted, I thought that it was a little bit too sweet for me, which was my mistake at the time. And that was just off a read, but it was well written and I really liked it. And I was very happy to attempt to produce it, but we were a bit busy at the time. We sort of had this deal with Net where it was her project, and if something came up our end, we'd let her know, and if something came up her end, she'd let us know. And we sort of ultimately had to try and help each other try and get the film made. And then an opportunity sort of came up, and I said, you know what, now I've had a rethink, and I said, I'd be very happy to direct it if you're happy for me to direct it. And you can come on board as a writer, producer, and, and help us make it. And she, like, it was just a phone call, and she said yes straight away. And over the next uh, few months, we worked hard to refine it. It was a great script written by Nat. It is in a way like a mini feature in that's got a beginning, middle and an end. And the thing I liked most of all was the interplay between Norman and Sam. You know, their relationship is kind of one of those classical universal things that I think everyone can relate to. Of a, a very young person seeing the world with new eyes and an older person who's a cynic and kind of the meeting in the middle. I think the way that we've been talking about it previously when I'd asked them for kind of thoughts and stuff, I knew it'd be in safe hands. I remember maybe a week before, before we started pre-production, Matt coming to me and being like, last line's a bit boring. <laughs> I was like, cheers, thanks, thanks so much. Um, and then I looked at the script and it was what? It was really boring. Um, so I remember going away and like really working hard on that final scene and making sure that that final line um, actually resonated. So sometimes it helps to have a producer <laughs> that doesn't tread lightly around you, we <laughs> can just say what he thinks, because um, inevitably it makes for a better film. Where's your dad? You never mentioned him. He left when I was a baby and didn't come back. Oh? Doesn't matter. No? Nah. Not that I wouldn't want a dad if I had one. I just don't. So it's fine. You can't miss something you don't remember having. The central idea is so pure that you can't get in the way of it. You know, and that's, uh, that's the strength of the script. I start by putting everything down on the paper, everything that I want to say, and then you take it all away because people don't say the things that they actually want to say. They are quite often, you know, you just read between the lines and it's the subtext. Um, and that's where you find your comedy and that's where you find your drama as well. I just thought the story was incredibly beautiful and really well executed and really well written by Natalie. And it was that and the team of people who were working on the team, the whole unit is, is fantastic. So that was really what it was that made me want to be part of it. It's always hard when you write something and you have to give it to somebody else. Because <laughs> um, maybe it doesn't turn out the way that you thought it would in your head. But um, Max's attention to detail and also his kind of drive to get everything right and to make a script the absolute best it can be um, made me feel safe about handing it over to somebody. Working with Mac was really nice and fun and enjoyable and when we first, when I first met him he was really nice to me and then I've liked him ever since. We had a really good chat on the phone before my first day and then we were both immediately on the same wavelength about the character and he gives fantastic notes and you know I think his vision is incredibly clear for what he wanted for the film and what he wants from the characters and how their relationships work and it's just been really straightforward from that aspect so I've really enjoyed it. He's very good, very good. You know, he understands what he's trying to do and he understands the graphs and the rhythms and the pacing and everything so he's got a good sense of that. It's just that it's the next stage where you just trust it. It's like the free playing violin as opposed to the violin which is ruining the music. And he can actually take the music away and then he plays and the violin just takes off. So you go into that whole different atmosphere, different stratosphere. For me, I never stop learning on anything that I shoot, particularly in drama. There's always room for improvement. What I learned was is that sometimes you don't need to do 
too much. Don't overdo it. But sometimes don't need to over explain. Trust the actors, you know. That's what they've trained for, that's what they're professional at. Obviously sometimes Joe needs a little bit of help on a couple of things you sort of go in there for, but I also it's the same for the for him too. You, you don't want to clog his mind with too much instruction because then he's thinking about oh, I've got to hit this mark, I've got to hit that mark. Sometimes it's better just let him do it. And he's come in with subtle notes. And that, and for me that's what I learned that it was okay to do that. The linkage is very good. So there's a real you get the feeling that oh the fence is well kind of held together. You get some production units which are chaotic, you know, I believe, but that, I never felt that for one minute with this. I felt this was a really first class unit. Just the sense of gravitas about the whole thing, you know, at any level of filmmaking, it was, it was really first class. And that comes out from the work. And because when you've got something like Phil Mayhew, who's such an old war horse as far as being a DP is concerned, you, you know that you, you're grounded, you know. Yeah, I've worked with Brown before, but a long time ago, 1978. It was a TV series and he played the baddie, actually. He's a terrific actor. And the thing about actors of that experience is they really know how to do it. They know how to switch it on and switch it off. Brian is just one of those very well-trained actors who I admire. They just take it all in their stride. I'm very phlegmatic about it, you know, and pragmatic. Que sera, sera, really. I've been working quite hard recently, something I can't be asked to do something in my but then you get a script like this and you are asked doing it. It's, it's, it's gratifying. And you realise that's what it's about ultimately. No matter how tired and how exhausted you are, it's, it is about the work. It is about the work. And when the work is good, you have to acknowledge it. What do you want? Your plants. They're nearly dead. I'm nearly dead. <laughs> I think it's nice that that old man lets you help him. Is he nice? No. Little pain in the ass.